Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10 or 15 hours of great content. But now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Creative Live. Welcome to Creative Live TV. I am your host, Kenna Klosterman, uh, coming to you from my home to yours. I am here uh, north of Seattle at a place called Whidbey Island, and super excited today to bring you behind the scenes. And what we're going to do is we're going to record a live version of our We Are Photographers podcast with Mr. Mark Edward Harris. And um, so before we dive straight into the podcast, which is normally an audio only podcast, uh, but now that we have launched our Creative Live TV, um, we are bringing those interviews to you live as sort of the uncut raw version uh, for what will then be the audio only version. So for starters, if you are tuning in on our Facebook feed, on YouTube, on Twitter, or directly on creativelive.com slash TV, I invite you to join the chat. You just click on the join chat icon if you're on creativelive.com slash TV and let me know where you're tuning in from. Uh, we love to give all of those shout outs, of course. Um, we are, like I said, very excited to have Mr. Mark Edward Harris. Mark has traveled to over 100 countries. So I want to see how many countries out there are tuning in right now at the moment. Uh, Mark is a photographer. He's done work that has spanned from editorial to travel to commercial work. Uh, he's been probably published in every photography magazine out there, uh, including National Geographic Traveler, Vanity Fair, Life, New York Times, and I could go on and on and on. He has an incredible career. He's won numerous awards from Clio Awards for his uh, commercial work to IPA Awards. Uh, he is an author of many books, all of which um, we're going to about to find out more about. So, very excited to bring on Mr. Mark Edward Harris. Mark, thank you for being here. Thank you, Ken. I, I got confused for a second when you said we we're very excited to have. I thought actually you were having somebody else, but uh, I'll, I'll take it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that introduction. Great uh, to be first here. Of, 
Yeah, first of all, I just want to, um, you know, say a shout out to you. And I hope that you, your loved ones um, are doing well. Um, and we are recording right now um, during these quarantine times. And yeah. of course, um, connecting here from my home um, to yours. And you're based in Los Angeles, right? Yeah, I'm based in L.A. Uh, and um, typically I'm gone half the year. And so this is very unusual for me. I, I cannot remember the last time that I had this long of a stretch here. Uh, but I, I'm, I think I'm making good use of it. I'm doing things that I wouldn't normally do. I'm really taking a look at L.A. with a camera and um, doing a lot of edits and catching up with writing, which I wouldn't do. And I've set up a, a home studio here. Uh, I've got a, uh, I'm now an ambassador for Stella Lights, and so I figured I better really know the lights more than, than the students, and so I've been uh, working at it. So I'll, I'll move out of the way just for a second, and so there's a couple of setups. And, and so, you know, I've always believed that, um, you know, one door closes and another one opens. Uh, this is an incredibly huge door, you know, like the, the door of a fortification of a, a castle that's closed on all of us. But, but you know, things, if we use things, you know, time the right way, we, we can, um, I've always believed, you know, try to turn a negative into a positive. And of course, there's families that have lost people during this time and people that are really ill. It's a serious time. But, but I do think for, for the masses, we can, we can learn from this for sure. Well, I think I appreciate that sentiment because I we've been having a lot of people here on Creative Live TV um, mm. come on and talk sort of during these times, uh, and it, it is it's this balance of um, mm. uh, of having empathy for everything that's happening and all the horrible things that are happening, and then as in life in general, trying to find those those silver linings um, yeah. as well. So having, and having compassion for ourselves and everybody all around the world. Um, so, well, let's start uh, talking about you and your photography. Uh, I The first thing I wanted to talk about is this Okay, so orangutans. Everybody huh. right now, if you are on your computer watching this or on your phone, wherever you are, uh, go to uh, Instagram and check out Mark Edward Harris photo, and you'll see the images that uh, some of the things that we're going to be talking about. But you have the cover of Outdoor Photographer magazine with an amazing image of an orangutan uh, in Borneo. And so... Tell me about not only this cover, but just I want to hear the story of falling in love with orangutans and because you've been working a lot with them. Yeah, I mean, I can't say I've dated any, so I wouldn't say fallen in love, but I, but I really have uh, some close friends might be a bit a safer way to say it. I'm, now, uh, orangutans are incredible. You know, there's five great apes. And so sometimes when I do workshops, I do a test about, okay, name the five great apes, you know, and, and people get most of them. They say, okay, uh, chimpanzees um, and uh, orangutans, uh, but, but bonobos is one that tends to slip by. That's not a word you hear so often. And humans are as well. Uh, but I was in Indianapolis of all places, and that's where I really discovered orangutans, which you wouldn't expect. But at the uh, in International Orangutan Center at the Indiana Zoo or Indianapolis Zoo, they do an incredible program there to, to work with orangutans. Uh, and so uh, as part of a story I was doing on Indianapolis, I f happened to be there at the opening of the center there and used a technique using uh, strobes to overpower the ambient light I did some, some portraits, and then while I was doing one of them, all of a sudden the orangutan signaled to me to turn the camera around, which, which I know it sounds unbelievable and stuff, but he wanted to see the back. I mean, they have a very high cognitive sense, in fact, uh, much higher than a lot of my friends, to be honest with you. But, uh, but I turned the camera around uh, and showed uh, the photo, and he sort of looked at it. And, and for those that think, oh, that's really questionable, there is a video on YouTube of a woman who had uh, burns. I don't know if you've seen that one. And she actually, uh, the orangutan, uh, uh, had her circle around and show the the burn on her on her shoulder and her back. And so that can be tracked down. Uh, so so their uh, their awareness of, of things, their, their 
their compassion, seeming compassion was just really something. So I shot that, got a good reaction to those photos, started going to other places in the States and then in Singapore, Japan, where they had orangutans and places that I could shoot using some lighting techniques. Uh, and then because of that, and, and that series winning some awards, uh, I was asked to go to Borneo to help out with the, Born the Bornean Orangutan Survival Foundation, which I do. And so that photo on the cover of, uh, of Outdoor Photographer, which is coming out very soon, uh, is a shot from that first trip. I've, uh, I've been back since to Borneo, to the Malaysian side. That was on the Indonesian side. And to see them in the wild and then to also work with them uh, when they were being um, cared for so they could be returned to the wild uh, was really an incredible um, experience. I mean, one of the experiences is when I was working with ones that have um, that lost their their parents or particularly their mom. They don't really hang out with their dads. Their dads sort of go their own way. Uh, but with their mothers, they tend to be with them from seven to nine, up to seven to nine years. But they lose them because uh, uh, of deforestation. And sometimes the mothers are killed. And so we have all these orphans. They're being raised, so hopefully to go in, into the wild either for the first time or be reintroduced. Um, and so I, that whole thing really just struck a nerve. And so I started doing my homework, reading books, uh, going back and shooting it. So I expect that to be uh, one of my next book projects to hopefully bring awareness to uh, what's going on with deforestation, the palm oil issues. It's not as black and white as palm oil's bad. This is that because palm oil's needed, different types of oils are needed. If you don't use palm oil, use another oil that could be even more um, destructive to the environment. So there's a lot of issues. People need to look into that instead of a blanket statement. But uh, so there's a, a, a long answer to a short question. But that's no, I mean, I, they're, it's, they're so beautiful. And I was Thank curious you. about the difference in photographing them in the wild yeah. uh, ver versus the portrait series that you have, again, <laughs> where it's, it, they're like, you're, I mean, full face, like it's a human being, oh, yeah. uh, the, the way that you connect with them in the eyes and oh, yeah. you know, seeing them into their soul and you photo, you photograph humans and people as well. Right. Uh, and so what, what are those similarities in the portrait experience? Well, we're, we're fellow great apes and, and we, um, so, so the approach is roughly the same. Uh, for the orangutans in captiv captivity, they're much more aware of people and used to it. Uh, to do that same thing uh, at at the uh, at BOSS, at the Bornean Orangutan Survival Foundation, uh, the orangutans did their their own thing much more. Uh, we're not so cooperative necessarily, necessarily. And also, I couldn't use strobes there, so I used some Stella lights, and I've now fallen in love with these 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 continuous lights rather than than strobes. Uh, but the ones like for the cover of Outdoor Photographer, that that's just with a long lens. Um, I carried a 300 and a 500. Uh, I have Nikon D850s mostly I'm using, and I tried out the D7, which is a great camera. And, and so those are just reportage documentary shots of what's going on. Uh, for the portraits, I carry a portable backdrop. Uh, and I do wait for that decisive moment when there's eye contact, when it seems to portray uh, something when there's a connection and, and there, there really is, it would be fascinating. And someday maybe there'll be the technology to really know what's going on. There are cognitive studies going on in, at the Indianapolis orangutan center. Uh, and they actually have games where we're playing tic-tac-toe and, and, uh, and recognition of objects and, and they'll beat us hands down any time. Uh, and it's it's really an incredible thing. And so so you know what's the key for uh, actual communication back and forth, a, a true conversation? You know, um, uh, someday that will be unlocked, and that will be fascinating. Won't it be? I mean, yeah. unbelievable. Just, Can you imagine it, that? It, it, I hadn't really thought about it in that way oh, before because yeah. you know that yes they can do these certain tasks that show you know that the cognitive understanding but then right. to actually have further conversations or such it, it will happen well will in northern happen. california you know they, they had the um the gorilla who's the fifth and not in that order but the uh, a great ape and um there was communication back and forth there 
Um, but yeah, it would really be amazing to see at a deep level what what they would say. I mean, some of them might be mad. It might not be for the general audience to hear what they have to say about how animals have been, you know, treated. Uh, true. But, yeah, true. But but uh, yeah, the 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 situation with uh, orangutans in the wild in Borneo. There's only two places uh, in the world where Borneos can still be seen in the wild, and, and that's Sumatra and Borneo. Uh, I just in January was in Australia after the bushfires and photographing there. And so I do take on uh, issues with animals uh, when it feels right, or if it's assigned by a, a publication, because they really don't have voices for themselves. Uh, and so- um, Take it, us it, to us. Take us to Australia. Uh, yeah. What was that experience for you? And can you tell us a story about, like yeah. you said, uh, experiencing what happened? I mean, to millions of animals, it was devastating. It was it was devastating. And in I went to Kangaroo Island because I've always just like when I teach workshops, I talk about you can't just go to an editor and say, uh, oh, I'm going to do a story on France or I'm gonna do a story on Germany or Japan or whatever, you have to get more in. The more you get into a story, just like I did a book on Japanese hot springs called The Way the Japanese Bath. I didn't do a story on Japan, it's too broad. Did a, did a book on North Korea because it's so far off the radar that I could. So so when it came to, to Australia, instead of just taking on Australia effect uh, you know, of the wildfires, I picked an island that in particular had an issue and that was Kangaroo Island. And on Kangaroo Island, um, they, they, they estimate up to 80 to 90% of the koalas were killed by the wildfires. And um, to go through there, I walked down this one road, um, which I sort of referred to as, as, as the Valley of Death. It, it was unbelievable, one animal after another that had been um, just, you know, burned to death by the the fires, uh, they had no place uh, to go. Um, you know, fires are, bushfires are a part of the natural cycle of, of fires. But what happens is, um, you know, through planting, you know, trees for, for, you know, tree farms and affect other things, and then trying to avoid fires, if they're not constantly cleared, things can build up and, and then you get a catastrophic fire rather than the annual, you know, or, or every so often a smaller fire. And so, uh, but I did see amazing work being done at the uh, Kangaroo um, Island uh, Nature Park, I believe it was called, but people are really doing amazing, amazing things, volunteers working to save the animals that were being brought in and they were being cared for in an incredible way. One of the amazing things about Kangaroo Island is about 100 years ago, they had sort of a Noah's Ark where they brought ca um, uh, koalas from the mainland to the island uh, because they were being hunted for their pelts. And so they had them there. And then there was a huge chlamydia outbreak with, with the koalas, but they didn't have it on Kangaroo Island. So all of a sudden you have this population that's pure uh, that that doesn't have that and an, another medical issue, and so then they f they were trying to figure out a way is let's let's get some of these koalas now back to the mainland, but keep them in quarantine so we'll always have a population of chlamydia free um, uh, koalas. Um, contraceptives are not an option, evidently, but that's another. Wow. Story. <laughs> yeah. Never thought about that either. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a really interesting point that you make about when you're approaching to tell a story mm -hmm. uh, that you you want to tell something maybe that's you, you need to get to that niche of the story or certain right. angle of the story. That's right. Yet then to tell sort of a universal uh, or perhaps much bigger story through a small story, if that makes sense. Oh, no. So I, go ahead. Well, no, no, you mean it makes perfect sense. That's that's exactly right. And there, there are times, just like Eve Arnold, who is a great photographer for Magnum Photos, she um, always, you know, she said either you're overwhelmed with work or you're sitting around for the phone to ring. So she looked for long-term projects to do to keep herself safe, and which is good to this day to have that that approach. And so she did a book called In China because at that time China was not open to the West, 
And so she took something on like that. Now you would not want to take on that for one photographer to take on China. It's just too diverse. It's too seen. So, so when I did a book on Iran or I did a book on North Korea, that's relatively not seen uh, in the West. And so, uh, but as I said, when I did a book on, on Japan, I picked something like, like Jody Cobb for National Geographic did a great thing on geisha and then, but really went deep where she went first with the, the, the Maiko, which are, are the, the, um, the geisha in training and, and really went deep and went through that. For my way of the Japanese bath series, it was something that was so much a part of Japanese culture, but a little bit off the, the, the beaten path. Uh, in order to do that, I mean, my ex-wife is still one of my best friends is is Japanese, and so that was very helpful, obviously. But I've I've, I've worked very hard to learn uh, Japanese, uh, and uh, and and because of that, I was able to uh, get in and, and and explain basically to people like uh, you know I'm doing this photo series. Do you mind if I shoot? Because I wanted to shoot reality as I was seeing it, and not say okay pose, do this or that, do this or that. And, and so, but I would have to sometimes explain this, you know, why is this guy Jin walking around with a, you know, a camera and a fundoshi and a, oh, not, not a fundoshi, but a tenagui. Fundoshi is sort of like the samurai, uh, not samurai, but the, um, the sumo underwear. Oh. Not that I, not, <laughs> not that I don't have that, but, but, um, but the tenagui is a, is a towel. And so, so there are absolutely stunning so many, you know, the black and white images uh, and sort of this combination of humans with the natural landscape that you can see through the windows. And mm -hmm. and and I did read you something you said uh, that was there are few places on Earth as magical as Japan. And well, so sure. what what is it about uh, Japan to you? But what was it that drew you to that particular story so much to, or or concept so much to publish a book um, with the best? Yeah. I, I, first, and maybe growing up, you know, I grew up in, in Tiburon and my dad worked for KCBS. And so that's up in the Bay Area. And, you know, so we're exposed to a lot of Asian culture. We used to go to Chinatown all the time for dinner and, you know, and to, you know, to, to the park Japan, where there was a tea house, so maybe that had an uh, effect on me. I did martial arts growing up, and, and to this day, it's still part of me. Uh, I, so I think the whole Asian culture, and also living in LA, of course, we have that, you know. Um, so that that might be part of it, but but I love the aesthetic, I love the discipline, um, and but then in the early '90s, I went to Beppu, which is on the southern island of Kyushu, a very famous town for for hot springs. And that was just fortuitous. That was not really planned. A friend of mine said, oh, we should go you know, for the hot springs. I said, okay. And then I did some photos there and I just fell in love with it. Just just the, you know, the, the different usages of, of, of natural hot spring water. I mean, it, it's sort of like golf courses. Every single golf course is different. And so every single bath is different. And the way that they present the water, sometimes with a cascade bath, uh, often it's in nature. I mean, the most mag magical thing is to have uh, to, to be in a hot spring with a view, with a winter view, with snow. Um, th that is really something to do. And then in Japan, you're actually allowed to drink sake in, 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 um, in hot springs. And so there's something called yukimi sake, which is, which is snow viewing while drinking sake. That's a great combination. So we're here, if you take you know, liquor in, into a hot tub here, you get kicked out. If you don't bring it in there, you get kicked out. So a little, little difference there, but it's so visually stunning. Um, and, and the steam, and that's also another thing why I particularly like to shoot hot springs in winter, is the steam hitting the cold air uh, creates this amazing surrealistic vapor uh, that is stunning. And I, th I think the Japanese awareness, you know, of you know, they talk about wabi-sabi and all that sort of thing. You know, the, the appreciation of the passage of time and that its effect on on things um, is, is, is really magnificent. And they really do have it down literally to an art. Mm, so true. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, so true. And it, it just everything about that series is just is really beautiful I appreciate um, so that. yeah and, well and, i want oh go ahead oh and it's been going on for for many years so that first it you know, started in 1992 the first book came out i think around 2003 then the second edition 2009 uh, the latest one just came out a couple of uh, months ago and they have it through amazon so there's a shameless plug um but it it's 
so I keep adding to it, but I, I continue, even though now I'm using digital cameras, I'm still converting it to black and white. There, there is something, you know, black and white, just by its very nature, makes something surreal. And, and then if, if the imagery you're creating with it is already surreal, then it really takes it to another another place. So uh, now I'm, because I'm very curious as to talk about North Korea, yeah. uh, because like you said, there are not many bodies of work out there necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or people have spent a lot of time. And so uh, tell us about how you approach this project. Just tell us all. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I tend to uh, not try to see things as black and white, uh, uh, except for you know, I'm shooting the baths or something else, literally in black and white. But but in terms of political things, I don't necessarily see things as good and bad, right and wrong. A lot of things, you know, there are cases like that. Uh, but but most things, you know, are, are variations that, that not everything's all bad, not everything's all good. Uh, and so there's a lot of complications, of course, with North Korea and it's a totalitarian, totalitarian uh, regime and all that. But we have to look at how we got there in the first place. We just can't say, oh, they're bad. They're the hermit kingdom or whatever. Well, first of all, the whole uh, peninsula was the hermit kingdom. It was not um, just North Korea. I mean, North Korea was not an entity uh, until after the Second World War when it was divided between um, you know, Russia and the allies, uh, rest of the allies. And so we have to look at the big picture. How did we get there in the first place? And it was the opium wars in, in neighboring China in the 1800s that got the Korean Peninsula to say, hey, we don't want a part of that. And then, you know, we, we pried the doors open. We, we saw what happened. Obviously, same thing in Japan, you know, in, you know, in the late 1800s, uh, you know, with Commodore Perry prying the doors open. Uh, and so that's where the route started. And then, uh, you know, by 1917, Japan was colonized uh, and annexed by the Japanese. And then, um, you know, instead of the Koreans immediately getting their country back in 1945 at the end of World War II, uh, it was divided up into zones of occupation, which unfortunately then solidified and the Cold War was basically fought and turned into a hot war in 1950 to 53. Uh, so we have to see, uh, so that, that's why, uh, you know, and, and my bachelor's is in history, my master's is a combination of history and other things. And so, so a lot of the stories I do, just like with Korea, I, I try to see things in that bigger picture. It's not like, oh, how did this guy get there? Well, I think I have a fairly decent idea of how he got there and, and the whys. And, not, and once again, not justifying it, because sometimes when somebody hears if there's anything good about that place, oh, well, it's, it, you know, just like when when Bernie Sanders said that that Cuba has, you know, a good school system, it's like, oh, they, how can they, you know, or or China or, or has whatever. Doesn't mean I'd want to live there. Doesn't mean divide, you know. But but I think we have to look at the, the bigger picture to really find solutions. Um, and people and, are, I mean, people are people. And, and people are it's, people. It's, you, you have to distinguish between a government and and humans who have uh, become in a certain place without intention necessarily, and and humans are humans. So, what did you learn about humanity through yeah. the people you interacted with in North Korea? Right, and Ken, right, that's exactly right. Humans are humans, and that's what I tend to look for: is daily life, no matter where we are. And people do try to get the the most out of daily life, no matter what situation it's in. And so in, in Korea, it's the same thing. And, and and one of the surprising things is just how much more aware of the outside they are than we give them credit for. One of the reasons is because what, when the Soviet Union broke up and it just became Russia and it became you know very entrepreneurial and, and commercial, uh, they never turned off the TVs channels because they have very limited access to the outside world in terms of TV and all that. And so they still they see commercials coming in from Russia. I went to an international film festival, it didn't have US films, but they had British films, lots of Chinese films, Indian films, Russian films. And so they see the outside world. They know where they have issues. So they're much more aware. But but you see kids walking to school, uh, laughing, uh, not being afraid to walk on the streets as if anything's going to happen to them. And, and we're talking about now 
10 trips for me there to, to seven of the nine provinces, and I believe there's nine there. So I've been throughout the country. Not everything staged for me. Sometimes people say, oh, well, it must be staged. It must know you're coming. Well, okay, so here's, you know, eight foreigners going through the country. You, you, you can't stage, you know, maybe Pyongyang is the show uh, city, and that's true. But the daily life we see on a daily basis. Now, there are many frustrations in terms of shooting because really your guides are tasked with basically taking you from, from one statue to another, one memorial to another, and you're seeing all these amazing things along the way. You know, they don't want you to photograph poverty and all that, but the more they get to know you and, and the more uh, they feel comfortable that you're just not out to get them, the more relaxed you can, um, you know, become, and then you, then you start getting the images that you really, you know, want to get to give you to give the bigger picture, to tell the bigger story. And I think from those ten uh, trips and two books, the second one being just the North Korea book, which won uh, IPA Book of the Year, very quickly. Uh, big plug there for the for the book. But that's that that's something that I really feel um, uh, strongly about. And, and I think that a lot of wars you know, happen and, and violence because we, because we have this us and them mentality. And for whatever reason, you know, even though I'm a huge sports person, I've played sports all my life, I really enjoyed the game and, and, and not the, the winning particularly. So I don't feel this need to say, hey, we're number one or or this or that. And I, I think that instinct of, uh, in fact, there's an amazing book I would recommend to people um, called The Lessons of History by Will and Ariel Durant. Uh, which is a very short book, uh, but it really sort of sums up, I think, the the, the big picture of humanity and the human tell me, condition. Tell me more. What did you well, take away from well, that? Well, one of the things about the book, they talk about in the 5,000 years of written human history, uh, there's only been a handful of years where there was no war. So they concluded that this is how men, um, and that could stand for men and women, but it does tend to be more men, uh, you know, settle conflict. And so fortunately now we do have sports and other ways to to sort of vent that very deep human um, nature in, in a more positive way. But then when, when you see, you know, people getting the fights over like, you know, oh, somebody's wearing, you know, the, the Denver Broncos color, you know, and you want to get into a fight over that. Well, that's pretty sad. But that is that same base that that creates you know wars and things that that need for that that tribal thing and so I think we have to be careful about um, that too much. It's like yes, yeah, celebrate your team. You know, have you know, you know. I like the Dodgers. I grew up a Dodger fan. But you know, as long as you know, if another team wins a World Series, that's fine. I mean, as long as it's not the Giants, obviously. But um, now I'm joking about that. I love the Giants, so. <laughs> Are you drop, dropping these names in for our uh, production team here at Creative Live? <laughs> well, I don't know, because one of them was wearing a St. Louis uh, outfit. He lives in Washington. I'm not getting that. I mean, I, I need to see a Seahawks, uh, you know, or a Mariners cap the next time around. I, I, that didn't go unnoticed. <laughs> it mine. No, but, but you know, it's, it's a competition that's great. Let's, let's, let's enjoy the competition, you know, and not the, the, the winning or losing, if everybody does the best they can, well, then that's great. That, that, that's what it's all about. And that's one thing that, and I grew up with a father with polio who um, had a very severe case of polio, and he, he actually passed away last year, but but Sorry. had an amazing life. And it, he was amazing, long life, and, and I really learned so much from him. Uh, just in, incredible how, how to live life. And, so, and, yeah. no, keep going. I was going to say, I mean, this is a time right now as we're talking where it's a very challenging time for everyone and yet a lot of times through adversity uh, people grow stronger and all that so for your father to live that long of a life yeah. with polio what did you learn from him well, well if you grow up in a, in a family and this I think goes from my brother as well uh, there was never any excuses not, not that we had any but you just do the best uh, you can. It was just automatic. It's like, oh, I couldn't do this because because whatever follows that because doesn't really mean very much. And and if it's a serious enough situation that follows, well, then everybody knows that anyway. But if you couldn't do this because, you know, you, you dropped your hard drive, you did this, you did that, you know, you, your dog needed to walk, and you know, whatever. 
th those excuses don't mean much. And in, in, in a professional world, as a professional photographer, if you don't come back with a shot, oh, I couldn't get it because a uh, famous photo editor, uh, as some of the audience might know, uh, but said um, at National Geographic, uh, we publish pictures, not excuses. And that is is a hundred percent true. And I think that goes obviously that could be applied to any sort of work or anything. Just do the job, do the best you can. If there's a serious situation, people will understand that. But just be honest. If but 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 the main and so that's one of the key things I learned from my father for sure, is 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 that uh, and also to have a sense of humor, at the same time. I mean things do happen and people understand people tend to be compassionate i mean i you know we all have our own issues and our own achilles heel and um if you let people know it's like okay they'll try to work with you you know you know with that and and so but but really and, and maybe once again maybe that's the one thing I, I really enjoy about asia particularly is i love that you know work ethic and and so so it probably comes full circle in in, in that way for sure Mm. I, I, I read something that, um, you wrote, uh, if you always succeed, you're not trying hard enough. Oh, thank you. Gabby, and where, did I, where did I write that? I saw it on Instagram. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate so, that. So the strong belief in that, that it takes our, our failures, quote unquote failures, uh, to yeah. push us forward beyond what we think we can do. Oh, so yeah. can you tell us about a time when you didn't succeed. Uh, maybe it was a, a, again, not that there were excuses, but yeah. uh, was there a story you were trying to get and it didn't work out or, or just in life in general? Sure. Well, I mean, just, just, just to show another example of, of that sort of thing in, in, a, in a broader, this is when we talk about sports, like, like Barry Bonds could buy about a thousand if he wanted to stay down in the minor leagues or, or let's say just play, you know, a college team his whole life or whatever. But uh, you know, you, you, you go for the big leagues and, and you go for it. And so in photography, uh, 100%, you'll get that. You, uh, coming up with ideas that don't work. I would say uh, for my books, you know, trying to get publishers and, and, and um, you know, one passes for whatever reason. And, and so you could be defensive and say, oh, you know, they have no taste. Or this. But, but, you know, that's, 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 I think, an unfortunate way to take it. They have their own reasons. They have their own concerns. Uh, it probably took me, um, for my first book about other photographers, uh, I don't know, maybe three or four um, publishers until I got the right one. And so I simply accepted, okay, they don't want to do it for whatever reason. I mean, there were logistical things or, or economic things to get rights to other photographers that was, were going to be an ad. So, so that was a more complicated book. Um, so, so, but all, yeah, all the time. I mean, the norm in photography is you're showing your portfolio around. Sometimes you get a job. Sometimes you're up for it. Sometimes you're, you're, you're second or this or that. But, but people choosing the photos have their reasons. Um, so there's probably too many. I don't know if one really sticks out other than that book. I do remember that, but I think there's too many to listen. But what you do is you simply say, and if you get feedback. If somebody says, "Oh, we're not using this because," well, maybe listen to that because, and you can you can use that. Uh, so there is sometimes, you know, a, a time where like, hey, maybe this really isn't working, and you have to move on. But a lot of the time, it's like, okay, wait a second, uh, maybe th this wasn't a good fit. I have to try this publication or this publication, this uh, publication. And if you really believe in the project, normally you'll, you'll find a good home for it. What I love about what you're just talking about, it makes me think uh, that also you can't really take a lot of things personally, yeah, uh, which is a, a which is a daily struggle for me, I think. Okay. But but in that sense of you're talking about how okay maybe it wasn't this particular project wasn't right for that particular editor for that magazine at yeah. that moment in That's time. Right. That's right. But it doesn't mean that it's not going to be right for somebody else. And I I feel like when we just get one no. And then we shut down. Yeah, that that's again where you're not going to completely succeed in what you're trying to do. I, I'm curious for yeah. you because you have had um, such an incredible career. What does success mean to you today, yeah. and is it yeah. diff is it different <laughs> than what it meant to you when you first started photography? 
You're asking at such an interesting time, and boy, I'm so many of our friends. I mean, Michelle Velberg, who introduced us, who's such a great photographer. I think I'm sure she's going through, and everybody else. And this is, and and people working in the travel world, which obviously I, I tend to do a lot too. Boy, success now. That's interesting because I mean, so many of my workshops have canceled. I mean, the next one we have. And I, can I say for sure? I don't know. But is to Bhutan at the end of September, beginning of October. Everything until then uh, is pretty much canceled. So, so, uh, but I don't necessarily look for outward things to to say. Okay, you're successful because you got this. Um, I mean, I, I definitely feel good that 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 you know now I've got eight books out, and so those are tangible things. Uh, I think one of the keys, the one thing you don't want is to say, I wish I did this, I wish I did that. And so I really consciously uh, avoid that by actually doing things because it's, 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 it's really the things you don't do you regret for the most part. You know, so, so uh, I think success so far is living a life where I've basically gone for it. And, and I do ask myself the question, uh, which actually I think it's my mother who gave me this question to ask in the first place is, will you regret it if you don't do it? And so most of the time the answer is yes. Uh, so, so you go for it. I mean, there were times, you know, I went, I did a story um, in Iraq a couple of years ago and I didn't tell anybody I was going because I didn't want to hear why I shouldn't want to go. Uh, and it was a fascinating experience. Can you share a story from that experience? Well, it was that, not that was you that was unique or or unexpected. Yeah, uh, it, it was it was for the New York Times. They were doing something on was it safe to travel uh, to the Kurdish region of Iraq, and, and it really was. I got into one dicey um, thing in into hook in a, in a mall where maybe I was shooting a photo I shouldn't have shot, and and people started getting it was it got pretty intense. And we had an ama amazing security team that reacted so fast and didn't overreact. It, it was incredibly I impressive. But but really, it was there again, people just trying to go about their lives, doing the best they could during stressful circumstances. We were there when Mosul was being bombed, which we actually did see from a high precipice. Um, but what's, it's always the same. It's so you know, common people are just trying to do the best they can. They want to take care of the kids. They want to be proud of their kids. They want to see them do well at homework. You know, the first thing is you got to put food on the table, right? So that's always the first concern. But once you get past that, people are not, you know, you know, sitting down constantly, you know, looking at the geopolitical map and, oh, we got to do this or that. They're looking about, you know, how did their kids do today at school? Um, and so, yeah, we did go up to uh, one of Hussein's uh, palaces that had been bombed out, you know, to walk through there and to think about the history that had just happened there, to to drive to, you know, about 17 kilometers from Mosul, you know, and seeing, you know, what was going on there. And, um, but throughout the country, uh, just, just, just to, you know, the Peshmerga there, very impressive people, and we got to, to meet them there. I mean, there's, so so that was uh, something, you know, I mean, even in LA right now, you know, I'm doing this naked Hollywood um, photo essay, uh, which, which because, you know, you were from down here, you noticed one of the images from Pink's, which is closed up right now. And I waited for the extra element of, uh, of a woman walking through, carrying a bunch of toilet paper and wearing a mask. Um, so, so, so you can whether it's Iraq or LA or anywhere else. There's always stories to be told, but I, I do think it, 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 you have to have a combination of a, an active mind and then no mind to use this sort of a meditative thing. You have to have both at the same time, and I, and I think that um, my ex-wife never accused me of thinking too much, and so I think I got that first part down. Pretty well. Actually, she, she's amazing. I got to say that. She's back in Japan. She's a tea master. Anybody goes to Japan, send me an email. You've got to take her workshop. Shameless I, plug. I will take you up on that because... And I drink I, green I, tea every day, by the way, because of that. She makes the most amazing green tea. I start every morning with, with, with matcha powder and I, I feel great. So that that's actually, you know, and, so, and I'm doing qigong. So what am I doing now? Because we talked about this earlier. During this period... Um, you know, I go to the gym every day when I'm in L.A., but of course that closed up because of, of this. 
And so fortuitously, and you never know really how things happen exactly, but I, I put it out into the universe. I got these uh, DVDs on Qigong and Tai Chi, and I had done Tai Chi years ago, but I hadn't done Qigong. And now every morning I start the day, besides this banana green tea shake, I do Qigong, which is this incredible you know, movement series for, that's similar to Tai Chi every single day. Um, I mean, we've got to keep ourselves physically and mentally active. It's amazing what you're doing and so many other people are doing online now with classes. I'm an active participant in, in them. Uh, I'm, I'm doing six days a week, four Japanese, two, China, two Mandarin uh, language studies one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'm doing the lighting here with the Stella Lights in the studio. So I think there's so much you can uh, you can do and, and turn a negative into a positive. You know, obviously there's huge economic concerns and I'm part of that for sure. But I, I think we can, you, you know, the one thing we all have is time and when it's gone, it's gone. And so I don't think this is a time to sit around and just wait for this to be over. I think it's a time to use to, to explore and, and use the time as best we can. I think that there's so many interesting things about time right mm -hmm. now that we're all experiencing because like you, you were describing earlier what it means to be fully present. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're photographing or you're looking to be in the zone to tell That's stories right. and what have you. And right now people don't know what day of the week it is. You don't know what time of day it is. And so time has become this very fluid, odd thing. And that, reminds us that we've kind of constructed what time means to us sure. as a culture. Yeah. And so there is so much going back to, you know, with, with the practice of Qigong or meditation yeah. or all these things mm -hmm. of, of getting you to presence, mm -hmm. which that is the being uh, that the, just having an experience. So what does Qigong do for you uh, from an, um, a, physical, emotional, um, neurological standpoint. Yeah. Well, I, and, and you said it so right on because I really do have a, a problem, you know, sometimes with anxiety and being, you know, out there sort of in, in the clouds a little bit. And I think it helps grounds me just like I love golf. Golf is active meditation, same thing, you know, hiking. I love getting out. I, you know, I, I think one of the weird things about being in North Korea is I feel so present when I'm there. I, I kind of like, being in what other people consider somewhat stressful situations because it feels like, well, that's more the norm for me, you know, and because it's that baseline anxiety that, you know, other people would have, but I'm normally there. And, but, and I do, I know Qigong, I don't think I know that, that it's giving me, first of all, it, it's, it's so much more than just, you know, getting a good stretch, stress and getting the chi to flow through your body and all that sort of stuff. But it, it, it's, it's just really, you know, grounding me uh, and and it's a, it's something you could do at home in a, in a very very small space and I, I but I think we all can find you know things like that I think the one thing we can't do and it and a lot of people do is sit there and watch the news all the time you know to watch uh, you know the town hall on coronavirus yes we do have to be aware of what's going on and and and, and I'm acutely aware of that. And, and we have to play by the rules. I, I think it's amazing what California, I know California is not teaming up with your state and, and Oregon. Um, you know, we have to listen to, to the governors and say, you know, stay at home. You know, we, we pay a bit of a price now uh, and, and we'll get a much bigger payoff later. And so, um, so, but when we're at home, when we're doing things, I think we can, can, can really focus in on things we need to do. And like there's other, you know, obviously, you know, Creative Life has so many amazing classes. There's places like Coursera, other places. This could be a really a time for, for growth. Uh, and um, it, it's very exciting. I mean, just what's again, unfortunately, the one thing that we have to really all be concerned about is the economics of it. But, but this will pass. Everything else does. Uh, it's amazing to look back in history to see, you know, what happened 1917, 18 with the pandemic there. I mean, look at the tools they had then are nothing compared to now, but yet they were able to pretty much track it to see who was doing what. I, I, I then took the opportunity to look at Typhoid Mary to see what happened to her. And she wasn't part of 
you know, that was a typhoid breakout. That wasn't, you know, what they had, the Spanish flu. But but um, to look how they tracked her down and how she interfaced, I think, with 51 people she got infected. I mean, look at the tools they had then. We have the most amazing tools in the world now to, to, to figure out, you know, what's going on. So we will get through this for sure, as long as we all cooperate. And that's the one thing I see when I go out and, and I shoot, is the amazing cooperation. It's, it's unbelievable that you see, I drive up La Brea, I see people staying six far, six, six, well, that's a bad Freudian, so, six feet apart at, 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 at Trader Joe's. I mean, that's incredible that people really are taking it upon themselves to be part of the solution. I mean, that, that's amazing. It, it, that's so impressive. But then, of course, I'm also focusing on the homeless people, you know, and, and they don't have much of a choice. So we have serious issues, and Gover Governor Newsom today was talking about that, that we, ca we can't just get back to status quo once we get past this. we got to learn from this and figure out, well, how can we make a better situation, you know, out of this? And, and one of the things, I, I do want to, not to get too political or whatever, but... Um, you know, many years ago, a lot of the uh, mental institutions were closed down uh, and, and putting people on the street. I don't think that's doing anybody any good. I think we should revisit that people need to be housed properly and, and taken care of. Uh, sleeping under overpasses is not a solution. Um, you know, oh, they got freedom so they can sleep under an overpass. Well, the, the people I have seen in the last couple of weeks doing this series need some serious intervention. It, it's, it's just beyond belief. Um, so. and, and if listeners aren't familiar with Los Angeles has one of the largest homeless populations. Um, and, and of course, right, a lot of uh, being, uh, people experiencing homelessness is not a, uh, a clear issue. I mean, there's so mm -hmm. many issues involved, like you said, in terms of mental health and mm -hmm. um, addiction and things. And just situationally, um, I've, I've spoken, I've had people on the podcast who were previously homeless and wow. it's, any of us could get there Yeah, and you don't realize that. And until it's times like now where I think so many people are with a, another economic crisis, but uh, so many people are realizing it's kind of equalizing a number of things, not everything, uh, but we're experiencing things that we didn't think we would. Uh, and oh, for sure, for sure. And, and, and these people have really skidded to the, to, to the very bottom, for sure. But what's interesting about and Hollywood, why I'm choosing Hollywood is because usually they're cloaked with all the tourists coming in and overrun, but now, with, you know, that they've disappeared. That's all you have left. You have barren streets and these people that are, are just in such desperate need. Now, now people, of course, you know, it's a complicated thing. Some people have to, you know, they're there because of not taking personal responsibility. Others because, you, you know, things have just slipped out of hand. Uh, and then others have serious mental issues. And then, of course, you know, drugs and so all of this. And so, uh, I, I don't know, it's a number 80. You, you probably you're your listeners would know more than me, but I thought is it eighty something thousand now? Insane or San Francisco? You know, do, do you just give people a bunch of tents and here go sleep? You know, out on the streets is that a solution? I, I don't I don't think so, but I, I do think that people that are in power now, this, this I was not particularly aware of our governor at all, Governor Newsom, or or or, or uh, our mayor here in L.A. and the one in San Francisco. I can't speak. Uh, about the mayor there, but um, I think the people are in power now. Really, uh, in California, are really working hard to to do something, and so um, maybe this is a call to arms for that as well. Right. I mean, again, it's looking at a challenging situation as an opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I I do have a final question for okay. you, Mark, and that is you you do you have a book, uh, mm -hmm. the travel photo essay describing a journey through images. That's true. So bringing it back around to photography, people at home, mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a time when I know a lot of people are going through and culling images, editing images that they may have put aside for yeah. a long time. So. Can you, through writing that book or, or what have you, can you give people some tips about uh, how you tell, 
how you how you describe a journey through images. How do you take go through a body of work and create an actual sort of essay out of that versus standalone images? Right. Well, I mean, if you take sort of you know just this is the Japanese book. If you take that from uh, as as what I did with Japan, it, it's you look you 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 delve in and you don't try to tell the whole big picture. As Eve Arnold said with in China, she had so much success with that. She then tried to, the publisher said, well, let's do the same thing in America. And it was a disaster, according to her. Uh, it was just too broad. People knew it too well. I mean, you had Robert Frank who did the Americans, but but that, that was not trying to show every state. Um, for, 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 for the book on the travel photo essay, uh, I really break it down and, and say uh, location is not a story. And as I said, North Korea is an exception, uh, you know, or when Eve Arnold did in China. Uh, but to really break down, and also, what do you know? What's what's what 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 are you an expert at? E everybody has things that they're particularly good at. Uh, my friend Nahoko Spice is an amazing fashion photographer, but she was really struggling in Japan. She was an editor for uh, magazines there, so she flew over to Paris and started working there. And so her combination of being such an expert uh, in, in, in the fashion field um, uh, gave her an edge there. She also knew design. Uh, uh, Michelle Valberg, who I mentioned before, her expertise on really knowing Canada and the indigenous people up there. Uh, so always look in before you look out. Actually, uh, Annie Leibovitz said the same thing to me. You don't have to run around the world to uh, to, to find stories. They're really in our own backyard. Uh, now, I tend to run around the world for stories. I happen to love that, but there are stories here. And, and so this uh, so I've, this this situation has given me an opportunity to practice what I preach and, sh and find something locally. But we can do it much closer to home. I mean, look through what you have. Take images you uh, and, and make one-off books. And there's an excellent company like Blurb B L U R B. There's also A and I. Lots of good books. Compile your images. In fact, I wish I could give homework to everybody out there. Do something on a recent trip you had, or if you love cooking, do 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 a do a cookbook. And those could be great, you know, presents for the holidays or whatever. In other words, you don't have to leave your house to create these interesting books, and you'll get it in the mail in a week or two. So I would highly recommend that. But but do. Be focused. Don't be too broad. That's really the key to, to a successful presentation of anything. Well, there you go, everyone. You do have your homework. From you have her. homework, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll grade it. I, <laughs> there you go. Uh, speaking of that, uh, where can people follow you? I want to make sure people can connect with you, find your books, follow you on Instagram. Where sort of the central hubs people can go? Well, I'm a very late bloomer to Instagram, but I've learned to to love it. And uh, I was late because of, of doing a lot of work in Iran and, and North Korea. Um, but it, it's at Mark Edward Harris photo. So that's my Instagram, Mark Edward Harris photo. My my website is simply just my name, Mark Edward Harris dot com dot com is not part of my name, but I think you're. you're Listeners can figure that one out for sure. Um, and I do workshops, and so the workshops are also listed, you know, on my website. And I love teaching. We do this photo floating, photo floating workshop uh, on river cruises, which um, we had one uh, that was scheduled for end of March in Venice, Italy. That didn't happen. I, I couldn't have picked two worst things, Italy and on a ship. But we're going to start that up again next year. I truly believe in them. I've done nine, the the, the most enjoyable things to do uh, in the world, and and um, we will get through this. And I think if we use the time, let's not waste four months of our lives just waiting for this to get over. Let's use the time. And there's so much. We are so fortunate. And I've thought about this before. Just like what we're doing. Just imagine what three decades ago we could not be doing what we're doing. Now we're able to 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 you know learn through uh, you know the web do all these amazing you know classes and things and so you know to say it's coming at a fortuitous time uh, might be stretching it but definitely we can use the tools uh, you know I've learned so much I mean just you know hearing your 
uh, podcast the other day with some of my you know friends talking photography. I learned a lot that I, I didn't know about them, and I've known them for years. So, so it just shows you, you know, the, just, just endless knowledge out there. There is endless knowledge out there, and sure. like you said, when you can be intentional about seeking it out mm -hmm. uh, and dedicate that time to yourself, it's your it's your choice to do so. That's for sure. Uh, Beautiful sentiments. Well, thank, thank you, you so it. much, Mark. And I do want to give a yeah. shout out to Michelle Valberg who introduced us. So That's right. thank you. I very much appreciate she's, it. She's she's watching, listening right now oh, as well. Good. Had good. Said hello. Uh, but uh, I just, as a fellow traveler, uh, travel travel photographer, uh, I was in Bhutan a year oh, ago. Oh, yeah, Yes, I mean, incredible wow. place, incredible people, and. Uh, and and so I just really appreciate all the work that you've done uh, to tell stories over your entire career. I mean, it's a lot of people here like, oh, you traveled to 100 countries. How lucky. Like, it's yeah. a lot of work. <laughs> well, and also, and, it's funny you should say that. I got to say that word luck. Uh, I, I, I use the word fortunate. Luck is pure chance. I think we all work too hard. Um that it's just luck. You know, winning the lottery might be luck, but 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 you getting to Cuba and doing that great work you did there, you you made that happen. Uh, you know, Michelle getting to, um, you know, towards the North Pole and all that, she made that happen. Of course, we're fortunate, hundred percent fortunate, and and I guess you could say lucky too in a sense. But really, uh, I think fortunate's a a better you know fit for sure. I see. I have a great friend Sachiko in Japan. Uh, who's done so much, so much amazing work. I mean, she's in law, but but she's able to get herself around the world. She built up such a great thing that she was able to expose her folks to the world. They hadn't traveled internationally. She took them to Switzerland to see the Alps. In other words, we create these things, and there's so much more we can create and to continue to create. It's just um, we're we're so fortunate to have those those opportunities. And then, of course, we have to help those that uh, are less fortunate as well. And I think through teaching, uh, I'm able to, um, and, and through my photo essays, just like with the koalas and things, you know, or the orangutans, they don't have a voice, or at least one that we can understand at this point. So just to bring it full circle. Uh, Beautiful. Thank you. Well, th thank you again so much, Mark. And we, I look forward to sharing uh, the audio version of this podcast uh, with the world uh, for everyone in a few weeks. And again, if you are tuning in right now on creativelive.com slash TV, check out the schedule of everything that we have coming up. We're coming to you from our homes uh, to yours with the living rooms, kitchens, uh, home studios, uh, of, of creators and entrepreneurs all around the globe uh, to bring you insights during during these challenging times and entertainment. We've been having musical performances. Yesterday, we had an, a celebrity hairstylist uh, teaching people how to cut their hair at, or cut their hair, cut other people's hair at home oh, uh, because wow. it's just something that that people need right now. So you can see everything happening on uh, creativelive.com slash TV. And then you can see all the past episodes, the 70 episodes of We Are Photographers on our website, wearephotographers.com slash podcast, or anywhere that you do listen to your podcasts. So once again, I'm going to sign off and say, see you next time. But thank you again to Mark Edward Harris. See you all soon. Thank you, Kenna.